Okay, I wanted to start off making a couple of comments on test one. They are all graded and in the grade book. They're in Blackboard if you want to take a look and see how you did. Um, they're set, they've been sent back to your schools, but some of them literally were just sent out like 40 minutes ago. So I don't know if your people at your school have them printed out and ready to hand back to you or not yet. But you should have them back shortly. Um, if you want to check out your grade in the grade book, you can in Blackboard. But a couple of comments I wanted to make. Um, test one is typically a little bit lower scores than you'd expect, even though it's review material, just because it does take a while to get used to the word problems. Um, I'm going to go over a few problems that gave people some troubles just to kind of give you a head start. Um, but before I do that, I do want to mention something called correction. I had mentioned this a little bit on the first day. Um, now that I've graded your tests and handed them back to you, you can redo the problems you got wrong. Now, when you redo them, that doesn't mean just write down the correct answer. You do have to show your work. And there's a couple of ways you can go about doing this. If you want to write them out on paper and give them to your contact person there to scan and send to me, that is fine. Or you can just type them up in an email and say problem, you know, problem number 13, and then just type your work into the email. It's a little bit trickier in email, but I should be able to catch on to what you're trying to say if you do it that way. So however you want to get those to me is fine. You get up to half your points back. I say up to um, because if you, sometimes you still have one wrong. Um, you can get half your points back if you do them all and do them correctly. I encourage you to work with others or get help if you have if you do not know the answer to a question. Don't just take a guess at it. Make sure you have them right before you send the corrections back to me. Um, there's two purposes I have to this. One is I do want you to have the correct answers down somewhere, but I also, I want you to actually see the correct process. So that's why I'm rewarding you with those points back. So if you're not sure on a question, ask your classmate, ask me. I'd be more than happy to, to help you out through email or if we have to take some class time, that's not a problem as well. Uh, make sure you have those right and have a correct process down for those. So let's say, well, I'm going to take a score lower than anybody got in the class. Let's say that you took the test and you scored a 60%, 60 out of 100. If my pen will start working again, here we go. So let's say you had 60 out of 100. After you do corrections, if you do all of your corrections and do them well, that turns into an 80 out of 100. That is now a C, which is a passing grade. Of course, 60 out of 100 is failing. So it's very important that you do those corrections, like I said, just to make sure you do know how to do them correctly and grade-wise, it'll help you out considerably if you do those. And I want to make sure before we get too far into the next unit that you guys do understand the the basic material, I want. To, I don't want to lose anybody right here in the third week of the course. Um, is there anybody that has their tests back that has questions on anything before I go over a few problems? Okay. So some of the ones I want to go over, I want to start off right away with number one. Number one, was that Medford or which? Yeah, I was going to say Apprentice I sent back early this morning. Medford I sent back literally like 40 minutes ago, so it might be a while before your person there gets them printed off and back to you. Um, Hurley, I had yours yesterday, so I got yours sent back yesterday afternoon. So hopefully you'll get them soon. You bet. So just something I want to go over that people had some struggles with. I realize most of you don't have them back yet. You'll probably know, recognize as we're doing the problem if it's a mistake you made. Uh, number one, the most common mistake people made was to combine the 22 minus 2 right away. 
Oops, let me resend it. So you, you can't combine the, the 22 minus 2 because that 2 is multiplying the parentheses, and multiplication has a higher priority than subtraction. So anything that happens to that 2, we have to multiply it before we can subtract it. So you have to do what's in the parentheses first. So in there, we have to go through those levels of priority, our order of operations. No more enclosing symbols. There is an exponent, the 3 squared, which is 9. So we replace that 3 squared with a 9. We continue on our next step. Well, there's multiplication in there, so we're going to do the 2 times 9 is 18. Now all that's left inside the parentheses is addition. So we'll do it left to right. 8 plus 18 is 26. And 26 plus 1 is 27. Now that reduces everything in the parentheses to a single number. So I can take the parentheses out. The 2 is in front of the parentheses with no operation. So we have to put in that multiplication. Now we still have, before we can subtract, we still have the multiplication there. 2 times 27 is 54. And 22 minus 54 is a negative 32. Several students came up with 540. Um, if you came up with 540, that means you did this subtraction first. And you ended up with 20 times 27, which remember you cannot do that subtraction till pretty much the last step. The other one that was a uh, commonly missed in the percent problems is number 19. For number 19, we're looking at a network discount for an office call is 11%. And after the discount, the cost was $267. We wanted to know what the cost would be without the discount. What would the price be without the discount? Well, the common tactic that is used here is to find 11% of the 267 and add it back on. The problem is that 11% does not come from the 267. Remember, when we deal with the percent problem, we have to find the base of the problem. The base of the problem is the number that all percents are calculated off of. In this case, the base is what we're looking for, the original price before the discount. So if we look at this, we have some original price or full price, or whatever you want to label it, they subtracted that discount to get the price paid. Bless you. That's the price paid after the discount. That price paid after the discount was the $267. We're looking for the original price up there. If we look at the percents, the original price was 100%. We subtract that discount of 11%, which means we paid 89%. So what we're working with here, the $267 matches up with 89. And what we're looking for, the original price matches up with 100. So what we're really dealing with there, instead of 11%, is actually 89%. If you cross multiply and divide there, 100 times 267 divided by 89, you're gonna get $300 for the original price. Now I get asked all the time, well, couldn't you have just, instead of doing it that way, couldn't you have just found 111%? Doesn't adding 11% back on do the same thing? And unfortunately it does not. Doing it this way, 
you're saying that 11% comes out of the 100. The 100 is the base. If you found 11% or found 111%, that would be making the 267 the base, and it is not. It's the amount after that portion has been taken out. So those percent increase and decrease problems like that are a little bit tricky. One last little thing on the test I want to mention, and that's just some of the things with Roman numerals. Um, for the most part, we did pretty well with the Roman numerals, but a few of you struggled with them. And part of it was because we had kind of a half class there. For, for, for a couple of you. But anyway, let's take a peek. Some of the things that we want to look at, so like um, number 29 is our converting. So for the first part, we had X, X, I, V. And remember, the way we decode this is we look at each value and then the value that comes after it. So X is worth 10. The next X is also worth 10. I is worth 1 and V is worth 5. So 10 is followed by an equal digit, so that's good. This 10 is followed by a smaller digit, so those are both good. So we've got 10 plus 10. Here we've got the 1, which is followed by a larger digit. That means we combine them. Some of you made the mistake of doing 1 minus 5. However, you have to do it the other way. It's always the big one minus the small one. So that becomes 5 minus 1. It's 1 taken away from the 5. You get 4, which adds up to 24. I'm going to skip the part B and go to part C on that one, which is I, 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 S, S. And most of you correctly decoded I is 1, 1, and 1. SS, many of you put down 1 half and 1 half. Unfortunately, SS, the two S's together make 1 half, not each S being 1 half. So that's 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 half, which is just 3 and a half. I'm a few of you put down 4 on that. And then the second part of that, going from standard digits, or Arabic numerals, back into Roman, 249. And there's a couple of ways this could be decoded that I would accept. Um, remember, really when you do it, you're going digit by digit. Some of you took it as the, the whole number all at once, and I accepted that. But the common way to do this is to go digit by digit. So 2 is 200. That's just 100 plus another 100. The 4 is 40. That is 10 taken away from 50. So XL. And then the 9 is just 9 ones. That's 1 taken away from 10. So that is technically the way that should have been decoded. I did accept, however, if you did 200 is CC, and then 49 is 1 taken away from 50. I accepted that as well. Um, again, I'm going to skip the second part of that, the B, and I'm going to go to part C of that one, which was 9.5. So again, it's easiest if you go digit by digit to code the 9. Well, that's 1 taken away from 10. So IX, and the half is then SS. I had some of you that tried to look at it all together that did do SSX. Um, remember, we, we try not to take away anything other than the 1s, 10s, and 100s. So that one's kind of questionable. And to be honest, I don't remember whether I accepted that or not. If you, if you did that and I didn't accept it, if I marked it wrong, um, when you do corrections, let me know and I'll, I'll accept it. Because it is kind of a clever way of doing it. But the key to doing that decoding, remember, is go digit by digit, not try to look at the whole value at once. Now, the Roman numerals are kind of important as we go on. In unit three, Roman numerals will pop up as some of our dosages, there are some medications where the dosage is still given in Roman numerals. Often when we're dealing with grains, it might be, you know, DR, 
IISS. That's saying two and a half grains of medication. Okay. Like I said, most of you don't have your tests back yet, so I'm not going to do anything more. If once you get your tests back, if you have questions, um, please feel free to send me an email or bring it up next class, and I will take some time to go over them if you need to. Today we want to look at our next step. In unit two here, we're going to look at more algebra and measurement. Those are really the, the last two big pieces that we have to bring together before we can go on into unit three, which is the, the heart of this course in the dosage calculations. So we're going to start today with basic algebra. Actually, over the next couple of classes, we're going to deal with some basic algebra. And hopefully we look at it in a way that, that helps you see things a little bit differently. To understand the way algebraic numbers work, it's best if we can draw a parallel to our regular numbers, to our whole numbers. And that key, again, is place value. Now, we've talked a little bit about powers and powers of 10. Let's do the 10 to the power of 3. That means 10 times 10 times 10, or 1,000. So 10 to the power of 5, that's 5 tens multiplied together, or 100,000. There's a pattern we can notice there, and that is that whatever the power of 10 is, that's how many zeros we end up following the 1 in our answer. Well, there's something else that we work with that has that same pattern. Our place values. This is the 1's place, the 10's place the hundreds place, the one thousands place, the ten thousands place, and so on. Well, if we look at that, 10 is just 10 to the power of 1. 100 is 10 to the power of 2. 1,000 is 10 to the power of 3. 10,000 is 10 to the power of 4, and so on like that. 1 is actually 10 to the power of 0. Now, we might look at that and say, well, 10 to the power of 0, how can that equal 1? Well, that's another spot where our definition of a power breaks down. The definition of a power, 10 to the third, means 3 tens multiplied together. Or 10 to the fifth is 5 tens multiplied together. Even 10 to the 1 is a little bit fuzzy, but it, it sort of makes sense. 1 10 multiplied together is just 10. But 10 to the 0... How can you possibly have zero tens multiplied together? Well, we look at it just like we did when we we're multiplying two negatives. We look at it in terms of a pattern. If we're doing powers of 10, 10 to the third we said was 1,000. 10 to the second we said was 100. 10 to the first is just 10. We see that every time we reduce that power by 1, this result is divided by 10. So as we keep going down through there, 10 divided by 10 would be 1. So 10 to the power of 0 has to be 1. In fact, this pattern can be taken for any number to create the idea that anything, any number, any variable, anything to the power of 0 is actually equal to 1. I could have 7 to the power of 0 would equal 1. x to the power of 0 equals 1. Anything to that power of 0 equals 1. So that creates our place values. And if you recall, we also talked about in the first week, if I have a number like 527, That's really an abbreviation for the longer form of that number, which is 500s 
plus two tens, plus seven ones. Well, seeing the place values written out here as powers of 10, we realize that we can rewrite that as five, and instead of 100, right, it's times 10 squared, plus two, instead of just writing out tens, we can just write 10. We don't have to write 10 to the one, plus seven, and instead of writing 10 to the zeros, we can just leave it as ones. Now, when we see it written out like that, it'll draw some amazing parallels to our algebraic numbers. I mean, we may have studied something called polynomials. And a polynomial is just an algebraic number. A common form of a polynomial might look like this. 3x squared plus 9x plus 2. If you look at that, you can see we've got x squared, x, and then there's nothing here. It draws amazing parallels to our whole numbers and the place values. Here, this is the ones digit. We don't write anything there. The 2 here can be thought of as being in the ones digit. We don't write anything there. This is the tens digit or the 10 to the 1. This is the x digit, or x to the 1. The 10 squared, or x squared. They actually have the same place value type system in algebraic numbers, as we do in whole numbers. Now, there are some, some weird things that come about in algebraic numbers that are different than whole numbers. The first one being, we always have to write it out in this long form like this. The second one being, we can have more than one digit in a place value. You know, and in our whole numbers, if this gets to 9, the next number, when it hits 10, we've got to move over to the next place value. We can only have one digit in there. In our algebraic numbers, we can have something like 5x plus, or 5x squared plus 13x plus 27. It's okay to have digits that are bigger than 9 in each value. The other thing, in our whole numbers and integers, Every digit in the number is either positive or every digit is negative. You know, this was obviously positive, 527, so every digit was positive. If we have a negative 239, every digit is negative. That's a negative 200. And a negative 310. And a negative 9 ones. Every digit is negative. Whereas in our algebraic number, we could have 3x squared and a negative 7x and a positive 1. And we could have each, each digit can be positive or negative all on its own. So as we do operations with those algebraic numbers, we can take something like 5x squared minus 9x plus 11 and add it to... 2x squared plus 7x minus 3. Most of us have probably been taught a shortcut, and that's just to eliminate the parentheses and combine like terms. Combine the x squared, then combine the x's, and then combine the 1's, which is just really a shortcut for the long process behind it all. And that longer process is addition that looks just like our addition with whole numbers or integers. We'll rewrite the first number. 5x squared minus 9x plus 11. And then we'll write the second number, making sure we line up the place values. The 2x squared goes under the 5x squared. The 7x goes under the negative 9x. And the th negative 3 ones go under the positive 11 ones. And now we're just adding down the columns. 11 and negative 3 makes 8. It's positive. Remember, when we add or subtract, we keep the same name, so those are still going to be 1s. Negative 9 and positive 7 is a negative 2. And again, those are going to stay x's. 5 and 2 is 7, and those stay x squared. Now, again, I'm not going to dwell on this because... Most of you have, have had algebra and have seen adding polynomials and don't need to go through it again. But it's interesting to see that there is a longer process out there and that it is really equivalent to the process we use with 
whole numbers and integers. I'll just do one example of subtraction here. So 5x to the third minus 7x plus 4 minus 3x squared plus 9x minus 11. And yes, I did something intentionally here. You'll notice here, this goes from 5x to the third to a negative 7x. Well, because the place values are written there, that's acceptable. If we had a number like 3,028, when we wrote that out in its expanded form, we would write the 3,000s. But because there's no hundreds, we wouldn't put the hundreds in there. We would just then go to two tens and eight ones. The same here, because the place values are all written out, that 0x squared doesn't get put in there. But when we do operations with it, we have to include that. So this is going to become 5x to the third, and we have to put in here 0x squared so that all our place values are accounted for. Then our negative 7x and positive 4. Then we write the second number. The 3x squared goes under the 0x squared positive 9x under the negative 7x, and the negative 11 with the 4. And now we do have to remember we are subtracting down our columns. So we have 4 minus negative 11. I always write it on the side just so I don't screw it up. That becomes 4 plus positive 11 for positive 15. Here we have negative 7 minus 9, which becomes negative 7 plus a negative 9 which is a negative 16x. 0 minus 3 is a negative 3x squared, and 5 minus nothing is 5x to the third. Now again, many of you were probably taught a shortcut, and that shortcut would have looked like this. Just take this negative in front of the parentheses, make it positive, and change the sign of every digit in the parentheses, and then you just remove them like you did with addition, and combine like terms. You're going to get the same result. This is just a shortcut of the longer process here. Now, before we can look at multiplying and dividing our algebraic numbers, we have to take a look at how powers work. You know, we said 10 to the third is three tens multiplied together. Well, x to the third means the same thing. Well, what if I have x to the third times x to the fifth? x to the third is three x's multiplied together. x to the fifth is five x's multiplied together. And if we're multiplying those, we now have a total of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 x's being multiplied together. So that multiplies out to be x to the 8. Most of you have probably been taught that there's a shortcut here. That when we are multiplying exponents that have the same base, remember in an exponent there are always two parts. The base is this number here. And this little number here is called the power. So when you're multiplying exponents that have the same base, these both have a base of x. To combine those, you just add the power. 3 plus 5 makes 8. That is x to the 8. So if I add y to the 9th times y to the 15th, what's that going to become? y to the, there we go, 24th. We could also have division, x to the fifth divided by x to the third. We can write division as a fraction like that, remember. x to the fifth, of course, is five x's multiplied together. X to the third is, once again, 3x is multiplied together. 
And because we can treat division and fractions kind of interchangeably like that, we can go through and just like in a fraction, we can divide out common factors or cancel out. We can divide out an X and another X and another X. And this gives us X times X or X squared. And I'm sure many of you have been taught the shortcut. If you are dividing exponents with the same base again, both of those have a base of X. To get the result, you can just subtract the powers. 5 minus 3 is 2, giving us X squared. So with that in mind, we can look at multiplying something like 7X to the 5th times 3 x to the third, and just like any other multiplication, we're going to combine the counts. 7 times 3 is 21, and also combine the names. x to the fifth times x to the third is x to the eighth. Now, of course, we can get more complex than that. Both of these are actually single digits. They're one count and one name. What if we combine something? that is a single digit with something else that is more than one digit. Well, when we did this with whole numbers, we might have had 42 times 3. We did 3 times 2 is 6, and then 3 times 4 is 12, and we have to carry the 1. The same type of process can be used here. We can take we're going to write the number with the most digits on top, the 5x plus 2, and we're multiplying by the 3x. Notice I didn't worry about lining up the like terms because when we multiply, we don't need the same name. We can do 3x times 2 is 6x. It's positive, so I'm going to put a plus in front of it. 3x times 5x is 15x squared. Now, again, most of you have probably been taught a shortcut. And that shortcut here is called distributing. To distribute here, just it's a shortcut of this longer process. You take the 3x and you multiply it by every digit inside the parentheses. 3x times 5x is 15x squared. 3x times 2x is 6x. Notice we get the same answer. It's just a little bit quicker to get there. We might look at multiplying multiple digit numbers. 5x plus 7 times 3x minus 2. Just like with whole numbers, we can set this up. Doesn't matter which one we put on top here. And we can multiply. We start with the last digit of the bottom number, which is the negative 2. Negative 2 times 7 is negative 14. Negative 2 times 5x is negative 10x. We move over to the next digit. We leave a blank or put a 0 in down here, however you want to do it. 3x times 7 is a positive 21x. 3x times 5x is 15x squared. And then we can combine the like pieces. We've got a negative 14. Negative 10x and positive 21x is a positive 11x and 15x squared. Now, again, uh, you guys were probably taught a shortcut called FOIL. And in FOIL, of course, F stands for first. 5x times 3x, being that 15x squared. 5x times the negative 10, being the negative. 5x times negative 2, being negative 10x. 7 times 3x, being 21x. I'm going to put that under the other x. And 7 times negative 2 is 14. And you combine the like terms. Getting that same result. We've looked at solving basic equations a little bit. The idea that 
all equations start out in the form of a variable equals a number. To understand these, it comes down to this symbol right here. That's the equal sign. And it's a little bit difficult to define the equal sign without using the term equals. But what it means is what's on one side has exactly the same value as what's on the other side. In fact, you can think of an equation as being a scale that balances around that equal sign. So here, x equals 7 is saying x and 7, perfectly balanced, have exactly the same value. Well, all equations, as I said, start out in this form as a variable equals a number or a number equals a variable. And they're built from there. To build them, there's a lot of things we can do. We can use any of our basic math operations. We can do adding, subtracting, multiplying, dividing. We can do powers roots, um, we can do exponentials, logarithms, trig functions, inverse trig functions, and, and the list just keeps going. Any operation we can do to a number, we can do to an equation to build on to it. To keep it simple, let's just add four. So if I add four there, this becomes x plus four. However, this equation is going to tilt unless I do exactly the same thing to the other side. So I have to add 4 on the right side as well. 7 plus 4 is 11. So we have now built a more complex equation. Now, we're not usually asked to build equations. What we're usually asked to do is solve equations. When we're being asked to solve an equation, what it's really asking us to do is to take the equation apart. Get it back to that form of a variable equals a number. Well, here this equation was built by adding 4, so how would we take it apart? The opposite of adding 4 would be, there we go. We subtract 4, gets rid of that 4, leaving us with x. We have to remember to do the exact same thing to the other side to keep it balanced. 11 minus 4 is 7. x equals 7. We got back to that original form. Now, in this case, we built this equation. So we knew how it was built and exactly what to do to take it apart. The key to being able to solve equations is being able to look at them and figure out how they were built. To do that, We might look at something like this. 2 is equal to y minus 7. We find where the equal sign is, right there, and then we identify which side of the equal sign the variable is on. So in this case, is that right side? And once we've done that, we ask two questions. Question one is, what is keeping our variable, in this case y, so what is keeping y, from being alone. And in this case, the answer is 7. That 7 is on the right side with the y. Our second question that we have to ask is, what operation was used to attach it to the y? To attach to our variable. And in this case, the 7 was subtracted. So to undo that and take it apart, the opposite of subtracting 7 is adding 7. So that 7's gone. We have y. We have to do the same thing to the other side. So 2 plus 7 is 9. So 9 equals y or y equals 7. We might look at some more complex examples. Uh, we might have something like 2x minus 3 equals 
13. And when we look at that, we again, we find that equal sign, which is right here, and we identify which side has the variable on it. That would be the left side. The two things keeping x from being alone are the two and the three. The operation used to attach them, well, the two is multiplied and the three was subtracted. So now we have to ask ourselves how this equation was built. In other words, what was done to x to build this equation? And we have to go back to our order of operations. If x were a number here, order of operations tells us we would have to multiply by 2 first. So the first step taken to build this equation is x was multiplied by 2. Then we could subtract the 3. So the 3 was subtracted. Well, if you think about it, if you put together a, a toy for a kid or you, you put together a piece of furniture or a model or anything and you've just finished, you've just put on that last piece and you go to take it apart, the first piece you need to take off is the last piece you put on. In this case, the last piece put on here was subtracting three. So that's the first piece we need to take off. We will add three. Takes that off. We have to keep things balanced by adding 3 to the other side. So over here we have 2x. Over here, 13 plus 3 is 16. Now we can get rid of the 2, which is multiplying x. So we get rid of it by dividing by 2. x equals 8. Now, again, I'm assuming most of you have been through algebra and seen solving equations. So we're going to kind of skim through this really quick in the next few minutes. We can run into problems like this. Here, we find our equal sign. We go to identify which side the variable is on. And we notice that the variable appears twice. We have a 5x and a 3x. Now it's the same variable, so we're okay there. If it was two different ones, we'd have problems at this point. It's the same variable, so we have to figure out some way to get it down to where the variable only appears once in this equation. And our first step is to combine or simplify each side of the equation. In this case, the 5x and the 3x are both on the same side, so we can just combine them. 5x and 3x make 8x. We can't forget that plus 7 there. 8x plus 7 equals 31. And now we can solve it just like we did any of our others. Subtract 7. 8x equals 24. And divide by the 8 x equals 3. Similar to that one, we could have an equation that looks like this. When we look at this one, we find our equal sign. We go to identify where the variable is, and we notice that the variable appears on each side. It's the same variable, but it's once on the left side and once on the right side. In that case, we have to get rid of one, and when we have to get the variable on one side. And we do go in this order. If there's things to combine, we do that first. And then the second thing we do, if the variables are still on both sides, we get rid of it on one side. So here, to get rid of one, we get rid of the smaller one, usually, which would be the 3x. So to get rid of it, we subtract 3x, and it's gone. From the left side, we have to take away 3x as well. We can only do that from the 5x. You get 2x plus 7 equals 11. And we can solve from there. Okay, we're running out of time. We're going to lose connection here in just about 40 seconds. So some homework to look at. 
page 49 through 50. Problems 1 through 43, the odds. On Friday, we are going to look at solving some more complex equations and doing word problems and maybe starting to get into some mixture problems. Okay, anybody have any questions on our stuff from today? Okay, things do start moving faster after this. I realize pretty much everything in the first three weeks here has been reviewed. Um, things do pick up here now in the next week or so. You guys have a great day, and we'll see you on Friday.